Ladies and gentlemen, hello again and welcome back to Don't Worry About the Government. My name is Chris Novembrino. Uh, I'm wearing a very appropriately themed shirt for today's episode here. Uh, my drones say cheese shirt. And joining me on the show today to talk about the war on terror at length is a person uh, involved in the panel who I think I've talked more about the war on terror with than anyone else. Welcome back to the show. F first time in a while here, Brian Halverson. Hello. And uh, I also wore an appropriate shirt based on the war on terror. I think you can uh, agree. This is, I don't uh, know what that is. This I see rainbows. Is there a cat? The, a the, unicat? The, the, unicorn yeah, cat? There's a unicorn cat uh, being ridden like a horse by uh, Deadpool. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that reminds me of when Bush landed on the, the unicorn. And uh, they did the ritualistic sacrifice and then emblazoned on the wall was mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's exactly how that happened. Yeah, I, I remember the news. Uh, so this is an interesting week. But last week, I guess, was the start of it. This is the first time we've gotten to tape. We are now in the beginning of the earnest, full-on withdrawal from Afghanistan. So it has been coming up on the 20 year anniversary of the Afghanistan occupation. Mm -hmm. We are pulling out. And unless you have been living under a rock, uh, you're pretty aware of how things are going. For those of you who are not following the news very closely, you'll probably appreciate a shorthand. And that shorthand is not very well. Things are not going well in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, to editorialize slightly. It's not the fall of Saigon, uh, it, but it ain't exactly a picnic either. The The footage and stuff that's coming out of there is pretty bad, and it looks like this has been handled pretty poorly. But, like, let's just start on Afghanistan, like the Mideast occupation stuff, before we even like get into the slate, man. Like, dude, 20 years of this. I suppose uh, the connection to Vietnam, as far as generational, is is appropriate. However, I think the ownership of Vietnam, as far as a generational ownership to the subject, I really feel like there was at least a time when the baby boomers owned vietnam as a subject well, i don't there's really a time see... where anyone could go to vietnam and i think living through right. covid yeah, we're sure. sort of seeing that like oh this is what it's like when everyone's a stakeholder it stays on everyone's mind it like lingers on everyone like that the vietnam mood or whatever but like to your what you're probably getting to is like the afghanistan and the iraq war really sort of had this ethereal quality because it wasn't like i was going to get drafted to go and fight it at any point right and i think that is i I don't know what the stats are as far as the Halliburtonization of war. I don't know how much Afghanistan as a war was uh, kind of taken over and thereby kind of uh, dissolved as a as a, as a as a contentious as contentious of a subject because you know you've got uh, private contractors doing a lot of the work, but uh, uh, still. Um, I think there is some kind of connection to, uh, I heard someone earlier today talking about how uh, Joe Biden always connects back to Scranton and how the typical small town uh, uh, adventurous person could very well be from Scranton who decided that there the military is the way out of Scranton and um, ended up in Afghanistan uh, and uh, now has certain feelings about uh, Joe Biden uh, that maybe they didn't used to have but like uh, we we're gonna get into uh, what exactly those feelings are and uh, it, not really sure yeah, no, I just feel this real sense of 
pointlessness. I mean, it always felt like the wars were pointless. When you and I met over a decade ago now, and we were talking about all this stuff, there was a sense of pointlessness among you, me, Jordan, Kevin, Sean, uh, everyone kind of involved in, like, Mach 1 CMN News. Like, it wasn't like we thought things were going well or that it was winnable. It was never a serious position in so far, even conservatives, when they would defend the military operation, they were never so bold in the last decade or so to actually say we can win this thing. They gave up on even selling us the notion that we could win this thing after the failed Bush surge. Yeah, and one thing I've I've never been certain of as far as the the standard of success, for instance, whenever whenever 9-11 happened and then it turned into let's get Saddam, the typical quote, and I've brought this up for a few reasons before on the show, the typical thing I heard from people was, is the world still better off now that Saddam is not in power? And that was always something where it kind of put the, the conversation in check. It's like, well, I, okay, we can that start really from there. That really is a how many uh, angels yeah. can dance on the head of a pin yeah, right. sort of question right. because it's like, but, yeah, I mean, yes, but also that. Uh. But so, Chris, if you're going to frame Afghanistan in that way, how do you even do that? There is no real even, there is no even, that's not even a question that, that is out there to pivot off of, fair or not. And so, like speaking just to the, uh, if, wh where are we? <laughs> like what what uh, what was the frame? What was what what just happened? <laughs> what was supposed to happen? Uh, I feel like there's a conclusion now to this story. It's it didn't go our way, but what was the introduction? What what, what? <laughs> Uh, that there is like uh... what other way could this have end? I mean, I like other than Biden does a really orderly exodus from Afghanistan where we get all of the people we need to get out in a timely manner. It was always going to end with us leaving the Afghanistan government, which stunk and stunk under Bush and stunk under Obama and Biden and stunk under Trump. Like, like those Karzai was always a crook. I remember we did a story years ago about bat, like suitcases of money being found. And I mean, like the, the corruption was rampant all throughout the Afghanistan government. So like the end game here was always going to be the stupid government we propped up falls down, replaced by the armed militia, the Taliban, who are propped up probably by some other nation state like Iran or something like that, because the citizenry doesn't really have a lot of interest in having a proper nation state known as Afghanistan. The mm -hmm. citizenry there is really interested in their townships. Like, you know, I mean, when they go like, why does democracy fail in a place like this? It's because the border is arbitrary and right. the people don't actually like think of Af like they think of themselves as Afghan people, but they don't think of Afghanistan in this like it's not necessarily the same way that Germans think well, Germans are a weird example, but like, like you know, like <laughs> the French think about yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Well, <laughs> the French think about their borders, let's say. Okay, so speaking of borders, the over the last week, the one thing that has come up that I can say unequivocally, I never had the, the proper appreciation before this week, is how this war has been lurching along due to the relationship that Pakistan and Afghanistan have that whenever whenever the Taliban want a place to get away from, they can always go there. And what do you do? And, but I feel like there has never been a, a, a journalistic flushing of that out to where the public can really appreciate that. And I feel like I still don't, I just know that it's real. And, and as of last week, like I knew Pakistan was something to be 
was a player that I didn't understand, but I didn't quite understand how they were a player in, in this war. And maybe you can help with that, but, uh, well, no, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up that specifically in that, that scenario where the Al Qaeda fighters and the Taliban fighters would periodically leave Afghanistan's borders and retreat oftentimes to Pakistan. And we'll get into Joe Biden, um, who who chose to highlight this week uh, in a selective highlighting that he was against the troop surge back in 2009 and turned against the war. And he brings up, oh, there are like less than 70 Al Qaeda fighters now in Afghanistan. They're all in Pakistan, which beggars the question really of like or begs the question, I suppose, is the beggars belief begging the question. Uh, But it begs the question. So what is our plan for at, or for Pakistan then? Like, yeah, I mean, if we're fighting terrorism, it's not really about borders then, is it? It's about this group, this militia group. Well, and also, uh, how akin is that is that relation is that relationship with the data? How is that akin to saying, well, l- look at the crisis at the southern border? not during the the harvest seasons when we don't need people to come over. L- uh, let's count the people then. And l- it seems like we have this problem under control. Is, it, no, it, the existence <laughs> of fighting season, which which is right. a, yeah, in, 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 right. in Afghanistan, allowed for a routine massaging of the numbers because they would use fighting season as a way of going, oh look, we got the things are going well. We're we're, we're winning, and, and they're just napping, um, you know. And you have the annual flare ups, and and how long the nap is doesn't necessarily correlate to how big the flare up is, you know. Uh, that was that was a big part of this war too. Uh, the, this the, even this even this when we think of how much uh, whether it's Iraq one or two or Afghanistan the lack of understanding of fighting season and how much over the years I can just estimate the public at large has been manipulated into uh, internalizing some sort of data without the context of fighting season. That has probably gone on. I I mean, I, I hate saying that has probably gone on, but I can just count on that. I, I can count on that being used as in, in one way or another on both sides of the argument, uh, whether it's a Democratic or Republican argument, they're going to use that knowing that the public can't contextualize this. And that that's just... Uh, mm. I mean, that is very much how this administration is downplaying how things are going over there is that they are sort of bamboozling people into thinking that like this is basically about as good as it possibly could go uh it, it's sort of uh the the term is sort of panglossian uh real quickly though before i lose it i i you know on the iraq war iraq too like most sequels bigger longer over budget and searching for a plot but you know the you know the actors are going to bring in the audience, and uh, yeah. yeah you, but but Iraq too, the search for Saddam's WMDs was just not that compelling of a plot, especially when they didn't find the WMDs. Like like that's a bad plot twist. It's a bad plot twist. All right, no no. Um, <laughs> seriously though, so with no, reg- it, it, hold on. If okay. you enjoy the entertainment tonight specials about how they're making the movie you should have to incorporate all of those positive feelings into your overall experience of the second movie and i don't feel like that's done enough and let's just let's now move on i i feel like we can move on now that that sounds good that Uh, was important no it was important (laughs) i'm glad we did that and we we can move on so Regarding Afghanistan, it looks like the Taliban is going to exert some control over Kabul. Um, The major military assets, there is already images of 
the special forces in the Taliban having captured U.S. technology, and they are arming themselves with that. They're going to control the cities and try to capture as much of it as possible. They'll have to withdraw to the mountains during during the winters. So this, it'll continue to look like this back and forth sort of thing. And it looks like in the absence of the United States and uh, our puppet government, now the Chinese government is stepping in as sort of the new, we're looking forward to work with the Taliban, uh, the new boss of sorts. I think that, this is interesting on a couple of levels. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily good. There is always going to be the risk that the Chinese use the Taliban as a proxy terror group to attack the United States with plausible deniability. Let's just be real about that. Let's be real about that. But I also don't think that this relationship between the Taliban and the Chinese is necessarily a marriage made in heaven either. The Chinese are currently overseeing the largest genocide of Muslims any nation state is involved in. And with their relationship with the Turkic Uyghurs uh, in East Turkestan, all, a.k.a. Xinjiang province, how long do Taliban ideologues with access to the internet turn a blind eye to the fact that their new working partner is, morally speaking, and th these are people who rightfully so do not have a lot of good things to say about the United States of America and our drones and our drones blowing up Afghanistan weddings. How do you go, I'm mad about the U.S. and their drones, but these re-education camps and the pair up and become family program that's ethnically cleansing all of these Uyghurs in East Turkestan... This seems fine. I, I can do business with these people. If I were to put myself in their the Taliban frame of mind, I would say that they are practicing ethnic cleansing through an isolationist perspective. And so because of this, uh, we don't have to fear this sort of reach that uh, I mean, the, the maybe capture other of Xinjiang, regimes might... Xinjiang's yeah. not even 100 years old. Like, they annexed that in the last, like, 75 years. Maybe maybe 100 years. Last 100, though. Like, I, I mean, let's put it this way. The Taliban's upset about Israel. I don't really know that, like, Xinjiang is going to be a home run, slam dunk, don't worry about this. I, what I, I think you're right, though, sort of instinctually of there will be a cleavage inside the Taliban of people who are realpolitik going, dude, guys, China's what we're dealing with now. The, it, I like power. We're in control of the government. We get to sleep in the good houses. Uh, you know, like, we're making the money. Like, this is a pretty nice life. So, yeah, in general, how much worse does the deal get, any deal, whenever you aren't dealing with China? Because you're definitely not dealing with America. Oh, uh, oh by the way, who, China who, has said in the past they're all about fighting terrorism, especially Islamic extremism. Yeah. Well, so really, who, who would be next as far as having that sort of relationship with? I mean, for the Taliban, they would want Iran. But Iran is a regional player. And Iran is in absolutely none position to stand up to China right. and, and is right. essentially kind of like in a lower seat sort of relationship in their dealings with China. So, so no, the Taliban, like, they win, but what do you win? Oh, by the way, the Delta variant. Yeah. And I'm watching all this footage out of Afghanistan this week, and these big machismo men, well, not necessarily big either, um, these machismo men, these men who are steeped in patriarchal values and this idea of men over women, are walking around, no coverings on their face. It's actually part of how they exert control. Um, so they are not masked, and they're walking around in public through the crowds. How long until the Taliban's ranks get decimated with the Delta variant? And it's not like they got the Regeneron and the third shot of the vaccine over there to go and get. Um, you know, insofar as these Taliban guys have access to the vaccine, there's probably a decent chunk of them who aren't going to get it stupidly, um, you know, for various reasons. So I don't, I mean, I think that their, their win here may be more temporary 
or maybe more temporary than they expect, but as temporary as all wins are in Afghanistan. You never hold on for very long. Yeah, that, what, what is the length of holding on you know, over the past, I don't know, three, 400 years in Afghanistan? Who has held on the longest? I mean, it's, it's got to be just a matter of decades uh, of any one regime. It's just that area is just it's a geographical nightmare uh uh which is advantageous when you want to get away with shit uh and what do you know uh i I mean so before we get in to biden on this show and we're going to get into biden's handling or mishandling of afghanistan at length here uh in, in no small part because I received a little bit of disgruntled feedback this week uh, that in, in, in the past, uh, this person has said we have cold takes. So I, I made sure to not heat my take up, but uh, I wanted to get a thick take, shall we say. You may, you may think it's cold, but it's going to be like gazpacho, baby. It's going to be thick. Have you ever had gazpacho? Yeah, yeah, I've had gazpacho. Yeah, yeah, no, it's going to be, uh, yeah, yeah, baby. I'm serving up the gazpacho this week. Yeah, I get to say gazpacho multiple. That's going to be the name of the episode. So before we get into that, I want to open up with this. <clears throat> However bad things are going right now in Afghanistan, it is absolutely impossible to envision a scenario where Donald Trump and Stephen Miller and whoever would be the new acting interim general or whatever would be handling this better. If Trump was still in office handling this withdrawal right now, it would go. It would be an absolute bloodbath because I, I think it's pretty clear how this would play out uh, for anyone who maybe has some ambiguity. Let me spell it out. Trump had set the deadline and he was even tweeting about this and sort of patting himself on the back that, you know, like he'd been pulling us out and he had forced Joe Biden's hand and committed Joe Biden's hand, which led some resistance Democrats this week to come up with this weird conspiracy that Joe Biden was absolutely powerless and stuck into a Trump trap. I mean, really a Trump trap. Uh, But, but like Trump was out there crowing that like, I I made this happen. We're finally getting out of Afghanistan. These forever wars are bad. This is like June 30th. So we start, withdrawing from Afghanistan and I think it's pretty clear that Trump the second things went bad he would want to expedite that as fast as humanly possible he'd be absolutely unconcerned with any of the Afghani nationals any of the people who had helped us essentially a lot of these bad quotes I'm about to read from Biden Trump would be saying them in the year 2021 if there's anything Trump would have to do in the Trumpiest way it's it's leave a country like you can't he would also bomb it Let, let's yeah. be clear oh, yeah. And yeah no as he's leaving especially after they do this he would he would lob the moab again the mother of all bombs yeah he would absolutely do that a second time but when you think about what are the what are the moments in in a in a trump term when trump might actually uh you know put forth some sort of presence of mind this is not that case. This is this is his opportunity in from his perspective to shine. And yeah, there there is there is no way it could have gone better. And there are so many different ways it could have gone worse. And it's how how much worse it could have gone is the real question. Uh I mean, but, which statement do you read from him and take literally? Is it that one where he's like then you bomb the bases and then you get our guys out like like that that one i mean but, okay it's syntactical but it sort of suggests like just how underthought donald yeah. trump would be when it comes to this withdrawal so i've been listening to a lot of hannity over this last week or as much as i can stand which is usually you know i i try i try an average 20 minutes or less a day uh take the weekends off but i've been trying to imagine uh how hannity would be playing how badly this withdrawal would be going if trump was 
the the one doing it and like he definitely knows what to do with biden doing what he's doing but like it really is difficult to imagine how they would play that being as how pro hawkish they want to be uh but then when you leave and leave in a shabby way you have to be hawkish as you leave uh in order no because you have to show some sort of strength right right? like like like, because this looks weak leaving looks weak so you need to do something to get your heat back in the wrestling parlance here and so that would involve like getting these guys in there and dropping bombs and that sort of thing uh it, it so I, this is not going well, but if we were in term two of Donald Trump right now and he was trying to wish away the Delta variant while, you know, bombing Afghanistan, abandoning every Afghani who helped us during the war and pulling us out as fast as possible and probably pissing off our allies even more than Joe Biden's pissing off our allies. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, we'll get into the UK story here. Yeah, anything... Any criticism you could lobby Joe Biden's way would be worse under Trump. So this is not to say Joe Biden is doing well or even doing acceptable. I feel like he is doing unacceptably bad here. It is just worth observing before we get into this. If you were going to vote for someone else or you're going to say someone else is going to do better, you'd have to make the argument that they would be doing better than Joe Biden. And I don't see that with Donald Trump. And I can't imagine seeing that with like a Ron DeSantis or anyone else here either. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's clear to most people, but less people think, I don't know, that like I'm doing this to carry water for the Republicans. No, no, no. It's really clear that the, pretty much any Republican who has a real chance at the nomination right now would be handling this worse than Joe Biden is. Yeah, and it would be... I mean, I, if this happened a little closer to the primaries, it would be interesting to hear the Republican nominees pivot off of this in different ways. Um, and I suppose whenever the primaries do happen, we will then get a better idea of how much this all matters to them. Uh, I it's going to be really hard for a lot of them to make hay off of this because so yeah. many of them have been on the wrong side of this war or right. really have, I mean, like what military experience does Ron DeSantis have to fall back on credibly? Like who cares about Ron DeSantis's opinion on Afghanistan? Yeah. I think if you were to pull the, uh, all of the, the 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 campaign directors of these future Republican nominees. Hey, in these debates, do you want Afghanistan to come up? They would go, uh, no thanks. We'd rather talk about something we can stir the public up in a more uh, focused way. Uh, I, I think they learned their lesson from Benghazi too. Uh, there's a real danger in overplaying a scandal like this even when times are relatively slow. But DeSantis this week was trying to use Afghanistan's crisis as a way of going, hey, Joe Biden, why are you talking about mass mandates? And that's a dog that absolutely won't hunt. And, And here's why. The mass mandates thing affects every single suburban mom's kid who is going to school. As we were talking about sort of to begin the show in this Iraq segment, Afghanistan, by virtue of the Republicans, you know, not like not that they're going to institute a draft, but like there is no draft. But and the Republicans did a really good job keeping this war abstract, ethereal, something you could never get too angry about because you never saw it too often. Remember, Bush kept the coffins coming back on the airplanes off of TV. They really did their best to make it so that you didn't feel this war. Well, Really hard to go, need you to feel this war right now in a really serious way 
while the biggest pandemic of your lifetimes, let us hope, um, is is underfoot and your kid is going back to school and may get the coronavirus, go to the hospital, get intubated and possibly die. Um, for any mother, what subject is of higher importance to them seems really, really obvious unless they're like a uh, dyed-in-the-wool Republican army mom who has COVID-19 and the safety of their kids due to COVID at a very low valence because they are, you know, they are anti-mask or anti-vax, possibly both, and also plays American pride fight the terrorism at an extremely high valence, but they're outlier people. So uh, this is why DeSantis isn't able to even get this off the ground with mass. I, I just don't, I don't see this being a political winner for the Republicans, but I'm certainly not comfortable in the slightest with liberals. Like uh, you said that pod save America link um, who uh. are making the case that just because Ron DeSantis can't get this dog to hunt, that means ipso facto, we don't have to care about it right. because and it's not yeah. going to be a political haymaker. It doesn't have any historical importance. Yeah. So just to be clear, what we're talking about is whether or not the Republicans will care or not. And the way the pod save America folks are framing it as they are kind of putting a halt to the, the journalistic investigation of all of why Afghanistan went wrong it won't matter because, unless it, it matters. Yeah, it won't matter unless it matters. And, and and if we don't talk about this too much, this will never gain any sort of traction. But this is such a nothing burger with, with the public that you don't even have to worry about it, which is a total leaning into the Trump news cycle that you were so fearful about. And, and this is where... Uh, um, no, this is where what I you're think, describing yeah. in, in, in like sort of vague strokes reminds me a lot like of an inversion of the way the Mueller report was processed, right? Where it's like, okay, this isn't going to have political relevance come 2020, and it didn't. No one saw COVID-19 coming, but there were a lot of people, I was not one of them, but there were a lot of people back at the time saying that this isn't going to matter in 2020, and as such whether they were like on the left and want to talk about the real issues or on the right and trying to play this down to make this a nothing burger, to make this feel like nothing. Um, they did that. And that wasn't a right way of processing that historical event then. And it would be a wrong way of processing Afghanistan now. Yeah. And the, the problem is, is that there was a, a kind of unilateral bemoaning of how the news cycle got sped up and what that does to people's attention spans. But then- And that once, played out during the Mueller saga. Right. And so once Biden became the president, you now have a liberal establishment media who has the opportunity to say, look, you all have been sped up in ways that were unfair and we are going to try and responsibly ratchet back that speed and here is afghanistan which is a perfect example of let us take you through the paces of this of, of this story in ways that the trump news cycle just will never do for you but if you don't provide that and you instead say, look at look at all this momentum that uh, that the news cycle uh, has, has brought upon this unfortunate story. And look how this momentum is just going to carry it away. And look at that problem. Go down the river. Did you just see that? And there is no meta. You, you, you all of a sudden are now no longer meta about how the news cycle works. And you're instead just saying, just, just lean into it, lean into the current and everything will be fine. And that's totally gross. No, and we're supposed to be processing stories for like a month. 
The problem with Trump is that you'd be processing stories in either one day arcs or five day arcs. Like, like, yeah, yeah. other than COVID-19, which was his Achilles heel because it was the plot arc that wouldn't go away. And this is the this is the Huxley prequel that no one ever got to read. Like, this is the moment when you're like, well, how come how come no one how come everyone at large stopped listening or stopped caring about what information is and how it turns into knowledge? And how come everyone at large is just good with the Soma, so to speak? How come everyone at large got there? How come it's not one stupid side or another? Well, that's because once the momentum starts, you actually need a part of the media to say, look, we, we got to, this is going to not feel good at all, but we have to do this. And, and if you never have that moment, it's just, it's the gradual decline. And, and what that would look like here in America, and it will sound far-fetched, I'm just trying to like paint a picture of an example. What that would look like here in America would be something like CNN actively goes to war against, I mean, they'd have to retool their own organization. I mean, you'd have to, gone is Chris Cuomo, obviously, but even like Brian Stelter would have to go, like a lot of people would have to go out to CNN. You'd have like Jake Tapper, You'd have Jake Tapper. Um, there, might, there might be a couple other people. Uh, but they would need to actively go to war against Fox News and MSNBC as partisan hacks, actively serving up crap media. Their network would need to be aggressively postured against them. That would essentially need to be their business model. Our business is putting the shit news out of business. It's a, this is a completely different CNN than we'll ever know. But like you would, Or you would need some sort of upstart network um, that really was actively going after those two networks as being part of the problem. Because even if, like, let's say you go, but I like Chris Hayes, a reasonable thing to say. Chris Hayes is pretty good, or Madi Hassan's pretty good. Uh, one, Madi will get work somewhere else, and he's good. He, he should, you know, continue to find work. Um, ditto with Chris Hayes. There are other places for these people to work. Um, and their work is being used as a way of, making people like Stephanie Rule and Nicole Wallace and other Democratic Party hacks and party messengers um, get their message out and giving them the veneer of credibility. Ditto with Rachel Maddow. Uh, so, you know, they're, I would rather those guys go away. I'm not trying to end their careers, but like scorching the network they're on, absolutely. It's, a, it's having a party news outlet is not new or novel to our time. But it is, at least in the, you know, sort of even in the old days when you look through history, it's never the hallmark of a good era when you have a really robust press that is done v via partisanship. And that is exactly what has bubbled up. Yeah, and uh, I guess in the past, uh, big moments with partisan media, uh, it was a different the 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 polarization of course wasn't driven by social media uh and it was it was driven through uh that, not that this was good but it was at least driven through journalism that eventually had to funnel through actual conversation <laughs> like whereas now it is such a bear trap where the the conversation no one's talking to anybody uh and you're either agreeing with someone and liking and retweeting or you're disagreeing with someone and retweeting angrily uh and i feel like the as far as having a uh a threshold of just how partisan it can get when it's partisan through the lens of social media, it's it's less of a threshold, and but we're still going to experience it. And I, uh, yeah, that's uh, I feel like I got kind of lost there, but no, damn it, no, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> uh, so while I don't necessarily think that this is at present moment 
the next Benghazi or the thing that takes down the Biden administration. It would be really, really nice if Biden and his team would stop saying stupid shit on a near daily basis during this crisis. I was. Yeah. And what? Yeah. What's also too bad is the way that so much of this criticism gets washed away is the right characterizes this as Biden being uh, senile. And so then the left earns brownie points by saying this is not Biden as a uh, as, as someone who is losing their faculties. But they also don't say this is, however, the Biden administration. And so because the original opposition is wrongheaded, uh, but in the right direction, uh, it's it, it's unfortunate that it never really has to uh, settle into the actual Biden administration, which is the thing that the uh, liberal establish, establishment said, don't worry about Biden. He's being put around so many good people. Well, so many good people just did this. So what's going on here? Hmm. Hmm. Snap snaps on that point for sure. Like like the whole point of Joe Biden was even if you think, as I believe, that politics, like most other businesses, um, here's another way of putting it. If you've got a CEO who's in their mid 70s in your board, you're usually trying to pressure that CEO to think about stepping down sometime in the next few years. Only in politics do we make this exception. Uh, in, in, in any other company, in any other job, we look at some point in the mid-70s as a point of decline to the point where we wouldn't necessarily trust the business in the hands of someone in their mid-70s and we'd feel better if a person a little bit younger had their hands on the reins. I mean, we make this exception with politics and the arguments, well, you know, politics is really a team sport. You've got a brand. That's the person at the front of the helm. But, like, they're really an empty suit. They're filled up with the team around them. Uh, and, and if you believe, as I do, um, you know, look, the right's going after him as being senile because they were upset that all throughout Trump's administration, Trump routinely demonstrated that senile or not, he was simply just not smart enough to understand the nuances of the job. I mean... You know, look, think about Afghanistan. They would have to, if the reporting is accurate, present Donald Trump the situation in pictures. And that'd be the only way he'd understand it because he wouldn't read stuff. He'd only understand the graphs and the pictures um, or only actually like sort of intake the graphs and the pictures. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to imagine you know him doing better here. But, uh, you know, Biden... I don't think is all there every day. Um, I've seen clips from him in the press pool. Like when he said like Facebook's killing companies or killing people, like, you know, like, yeah, it's sloppy, but that's beyond sloppy. That's like, it's a little sus is all I'm saying. But the assumption here is that everyone around Biden knows better where Biden's head's at than I do. And Biden was always sold to all of us. Uh, again, this is not, I was not buying. Um, I, that's why I didn't vote for him in the primaries. But like, he was sold to us as, it's not Joe Biden, really. You're getting a team of experienced people. Joe Biden knows the Democratic Party. And, he'll, you know, he'll be a really good figurehead for this. So when Anthony Blinken is out there saying stupid stuff, or Saki's out there saying stupid stuff, or you've got Lloyd Austin chirping up and making it known that he doesn't like anything and he's upset about stuff and this this is general mcraytheon if you don't remember lloyd austin this this yes, is the guy yes. who was Thank on you. the board of raytheon needed the exemption so that he could get this job so that he could come on the job and bitch uh like like dude okay you didn't have to take this job we actually broke the laws <laughs> to get you on the job so like shut up get on the trolley buddy Lloyd, uh, <laughs> learn your lessons here, Lloyd. Uh, yeah, no, um, I, I, this is the problem, is that I'm not really convinced that Joe Biden's team are cracking it up. And it's the same thing on the COVID front. Walensky and Fauci 
uh, don't necessarily inspire maximum confidence from me on a daily basis. So yeah, like I, that I think is a very fair indictment of this. And then the next layer down is this is a failure of military intelligence. So though I am upset with the Biden team, uh, clearly, 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 when Joe Biden made the decision on this, Joe Biden made the decision based off of the intelligence that was brought to him. He looked right. at that stuff that said, you know, we think it is good. And Joe Biden's brain still works plenty well enough to go, we think it is good. Okay, I say we withdraw. That's from my brain. Like, yeah, like, right. like yeah, that's then, what he was working off of. But then you're, uh, so you're, you're, you're McConnell and you're, or, or McCarthy, and, and you're in a room with, uh, uh, or let's say you're on a conference call with Hannity. It's like, look, look, guys, uh, we're, we're about to go down one of two n narrative uh, uh, wormholes here. One of them is the, is the one that we've been doing. It's the it's the Biden is old narrative. And then there's the other narrative we as the GOP can get behind. It's the, this was a military intelligence failure narrative. Which one do you think they're gonna go down? I mean, there is no way the GOP is going to put some opposition about how the military failed. That doesn't happen. That is a total non-starter. No, and it's so, it's why they are absolutely <laughs> lapping up this CIA thing where they're like, oh, right. yeah, we had a report that said that, like, oh, it's really bad. And, and, like, not for nothing, they probably did. I don't think they're lying on that. I think it's likely that they probably had other intelligence and stuff that said the other way, too. Right, That's how these right. things tend to go. Um, but I, I'm even going to go one step further in giving them credit. Um, I bet you they probably were saying this as, like, the consensus opinion. Uh, like I, I do think there was a certain naivete among Biden's team about the situation in Afghanistan and that much like COVID-19, they were so mentally committed to a temporal finish line that it was not an objective based finish line. And, and before anyone yells at their podcast, what did you have us stay there another 20 years, Chris? N no, no, but I would, uh, my my plan would be our objective is to withdraw sub objectives inside of that. Or we need to extract these people. We need to get rid of this stuff. We need to, if we've okay. got military equipment, that's still there. We need to get rid of that. And all of those, once we get down that checklist, that is completing the formula for withdrawal. It's not just August 30th is the drop dead day. And if you're not on the last boat out of Shanghai, bad news for you, Charlie. So, what if you are taking the defense of the quote unquote, there's too much to lose to 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 be uh, uh, properly critical of Joe Biden. If you are of the mind that the the Democratic well, I mean, not plan, for nothing, okay. real quickly on that point, how can there be too much to lose for being critical of Joe Biden? And at the same time, this is a political issue that absolutely will not matter in the upcoming election. This right. should be that is one this paradox. should be a free spar. Right. So how about this, Chris? Let's go into the possibility or probability that the plan for Joe Biden was to always be a one term president and that this was always Kamala uh, Kamala Harris's uh, uh uh, prequel uh, of sorts. Okay, so it, to that is, point, you got... how are things going as far as that plan goes? I think they're still on track, honestly. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, you know, because especially if, if, if that's the strategy and you got a teeny tiny tea leaf that maybe that is something being discussed or at least thought about in Biden's head uh, when he said, I'm not going to hand this off to a fifth president, which... That, that was during a speech that he did on either Monday or Tuesday. Like, I will not be handing this off to a fifth president. A sentence that truly only makes sense if Biden is a four-year president. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea that we would be in Afghanistan 30 years 
frankly, at 20 years is not implausible. But also, like, I mean, I, you never would say that out loud. Like, like that, right. that, yeah, no, I'm, clearly the implication there to me was if I'm not president in four years, this need, when I'm not president in four years, this needs to be done. I don't know if he meant that. I don't know if that was one of Biden's 8,000 gaffes this week, so I'm not going to read too heavy into it. But worth noting that, that that did get, like, shot out there this week and that caught my ear for sure in, among other things in that Biden speech and to your point if this is about handing it off to Kamala the fact that this is muddy and that she's laying low on all of this right now mm-hmm. makes it a lot easier for her to come in and go like and do the thing that Biden did this week with Obama where he's like actually I had all the smart decisions and they never let me do any of them all the ones that look really good in retrospect those are the ones I was championing yeah yeah, unfortunately, she was busy, and if she if she could have had her... Uh, she's got to go her, campaign for yeah. Gavin Newsom. That's right. If, if only, if only, Chris, if only we could have known what the Harris treatment to this problem could have, could have been. Uh, but because the Harris treatment is a better treatment let's go ahead and get behind her for 2024 uh the treatment we never saw uh that that's the one hey look yeah that's politics man yeah yeah i i don't like it i'm just you know it is no but uh yeah i i think still i agree with you that they are kind of still on track if the plan is for for Harris to take over and Biden to be actually to that president. point, not included in the in in Afghanistan, this segment here, uh, you know you like it, you know you like Afghanistan, baby. Uh, say it with me, Afghanistan. No, gazpacho. No. All right, <laughs> that's fine. So like she's not included in this, and then, you know there's Blinken and uh, Lloyd Austin we already mentioned, but a lot of Biden here. Uh, just to wind us back here, Afghanistan really began. Back in July 8th, when Joe Biden says the jury is still out, but the likelihood that there's going to be Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is unlikely. That was from the AP. Um, Later on in that same article from AP, which you can find the whole show slate on patreon.com slash DWATG. It's free, even if you're a free site or if you want the slate. A lot of times these are 15, 20 pages. Feel free to take a look at them. Um, They're all up there, patreon.com slash DWATG. Buck a show donation makes this show possible, by the way. Um, He says later on that same article, there's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off of a roof of an embassy of the United States from Afghanistan. I mean, come on. That's in July. That's in July. Now, it's funny that he brings up getting lifted off of the roof of an embassy as the imagery here because that took some people back to 1975 in the fall of Saigon because that's exactly what Joe Biden is evoking there. Back in those days, Joe Biden said, I do not believe the United States has an obligation more or otherwise to evacuate foreign nationals. The United States has no obligation to evacuate one or 100,000 in one South Vietnamese. Um, In April 1975, the remaining U.S. soldiers in Vietnam numbered in the thousands, and Gerald Ford was arguing, as the last troops were being evacuated from the country, that the U.S. should be evacuating the South Vietnamese who had been helping, too. Ford actually was, for his part, was actually pretty strong on this, so, like, give him a little credit here. United States has a long tradition of opening its doors to immigrants of all countries. We have felt or we felt that a number of these South Vietnamese have been very loyal to the United States and deserve the opportunity to live in freedom. Um, Joe Biden, for his part, was very much against this plan. Um, the article I originally got this, and I want to say, uh, uh, I'm holding on to the stick here for a second longer. Um, this is kind of a controversial thing, and I went. I, this is like a semi-conservative article from Washington Examiner. There's a fact check from Snopes, but then I'm like looking at some of the facts and the fact checks, and the fact checks don't fully check out. So I've actually taken the fact check article and fact checked that and the (laughs) truth lands somewhere in between the conservative article and the fact check article. Now, the thing that made me go and get a fact check in the first place is this passage in the article that I was originally reading that made Kissinger seem like a guy who gave a serious shit about Asianic people. Um, As someone who knows 
a lot about Henry Kissinger or even a marginal amount about Henry Kissinger. That that one beggared belief a little bit. So I found the transcript in question here um, between Biden and Kissinger. Uh, this is a transcript from the Senate hearings. Biden goes, what concerns us is that a week ago, Habib, who was a uh, secretary under Nixon, told us that we would be formulating a plan. A week has gone by and nothing has happened. We should focus on getting them out. By getting them out, he means the U.S. troops. Getting the Vietnamese out and military aid for the government of Vietnam are totally different. So here, Biden very clearly saying we should be focused on getting our military out, the Vietnamese or whatever. We'll deal with that at another time in another budget bill or something, maybe. Um, Kissinger goes, the plan for the American evacuation is in pretty good shape. But we had a report that if we pulled out and left them, which them only could possibly make sense as the Vietnamese, um, we might er have to fight the South Vietnamese. So the South Vietnamese would actually be angry at us, rightfully so, and probably start shooting at us as we left them there. Um, It was that we were concerned with this and why we wanted to go to two and didn't do it in the context of a bug out. The second problem is that getting American citizens out in an emer- it, the second problem is getting American citizens out in an emergency. The third is the Vietnamese to whom we have an obligation. So, so he's not a little less noble here, but like, look, we made a deal with these Vietnamese during this process. Um, this is infinitely more complicated and large scale. It this extraction of the Americans requires the government of Vietnam, Vietnam, and maybe even according to Kissinger, the North Vietnamese. So what he's saying to Biden here in this little quote is that, Joe, you think that this is just about getting the Americans out, but we're surrounded. We're surrounded by allies and enemies, and the allies can turn to enemies if we fuck over the allies. So you can't fuck over the allies. You need the allies to get us out of there a place we should never have been in the first place and have only been able to be in because of the allies. Yeah, I feel like Joe Biden arrives at certain conclusions and then there is no context that can reverse his conclusion. No, no. It, it, I mean, I've got I've got more on this, too. Uh, yeah. Let me let me read. Let me read Biden's response to Kissinger on this point, which I think is an uh, like. I, again, this is Henry Kissinger here, who I think we opened up the same and say, like, not a great guy. Um, but, like, this point is so, like, patently obvious. And Biden goes, I feel like I'm being presented in an all-or-nothing number. Y- yes, because there is no <laughs> half number here. Like, what you're getting is that, like, what's the whole number between zero and one? <laughs> there isn't one, Joe. Uh, it, it doesn't exist in this context. He goes, I don't want to have to vote to buy it at all or not at all. I'm not sure I could vote for an amount to put American troops in for one month or six months to get the Vietnamese out. I'll vote for any amount in getting the Americans out. That that particular last two sentence line is actually really atrocious if you want to read into it further. I'm not even going to go down the race reading of that. But the idea that he's willing to throw any amount of money to get the Americans who invaded Vietnam out, but none money for the Vietnamese who helped the Americans do the invasion, says something about the value of human life between white Americans and Asianic Vietnamese people that troubles me. Um, especially when the last sentence is, I don't want it mixed with getting the Vietnamese out. Now, mixed can be used in many contexts. It just happens to unfortunately hang in the shadows of that passage. I'm trying to imagine right now a circumstance in the DNC primary when this was illustrated to serve a point that Joe Biden might evacuate us from Afghanistan in the wrong way. And that also would never happen. (laughs) And, and, And I imagine there are some people listening right now who are like, Chris, this is bad. You're maybe maybe they're even with me and going, you're making a salient point about Biden in this Kissinger exchange. It's kind of rattling in my cage a little bit, but I don't see how this connects back to Afghanistan. Hold. Stay with me here. 
I want to finish this and I'm going to connect it up to today because this is all of a piece. I'm going to bring you up to May 2021 here in very short order. But to continue on a little bit more on the saga, he explained his views on this and then he he said that maybe there should be an attempt to move some of those personnel to other embassies or something like that like okay we'll evacuate them but like maybe somewhere else like not here Mm -hmm. um and then there was a vote in the senate foreign relations committee um and joe biden was one of the three nays and there was a conference report that also passed the senate as a whole by a vote of 46 17 where again joe biden voted against it so we'll fast forward a little bit maybe he learned something in their intervening years. Joe Biden's been in politics 46 years, Brian. And some people would say it's a bad thing, but other people who would defend that is, would say that's experience. And with experience, of course, comes growth and learning. Lots of beautiful learning. So Richard Holbrook in 2010 was the former, um, it was actually at that time, the special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And he said in his book that Biden insisted in 2010 that the United States needed to leave Afghanistan the same way it did in Vietnam, which I mean, now that you understand where Joe Biden's head was at in Vietnam, that is saying something. Holbrook wrote that Biden erupted when he mentioned women in Afghanistan. Holbrook mentioned women in Afghanistan, according to the diary excerpts from his book with Holbrook writing that. Biden almost rose up from his chair and said, I am not sending my boy back there to risk his life on behalf of women's rights. It just won't work. That's not what they're there for. Not for nothing, but uh, Bo went to Iraq, but like that's okay. Joe Biden, again, when people go, he's slipping. You got to remember, he was always a little slippy. Um, Holbrook said, this shocked me. And I commented immediately that I thought we had a certain obligation to the people who had trusted us. So, again, if you think, you know, Holbrook's out to lunch, again, Holbrook and Kissinger seem to agree on this basic idea of, like, you know, if you invade a country, you have an obligation to your allies. Biden responded saying, quote, fuck that. We don't have to worry about that. We did it in Vietnam. Nixon and Kissinger got away with it. Which is really interesting, Uh. given the history lesson I just gave y'all on that yeah it's the whole got away with it in motive does it got away with it mean it's bad right like they they did it it was bad and they got away with it like right you you never go like chris went down to the orphanage and he bought all those kids school books and he got away with it yeah yeah i hmm It's bad. It's bad. Now, to to wind it back, I wanted to get some kind of contemporary or extemporaneous. uh, That's the word. No, contemporaneous. I I guess they're both. I don't know. One of those is a word and maybe one of them isn't. Who knows? It's an adventure. (laughs) Every show's an adventure on here. Gaspacho. So, in 1975, at the time, Robert Nowak Nowak and Roland Evans um, were covering Biden's interactions with Gerald Ford. And their reporting said that other senators who supported Biden at the time were taken aback by Joe Biden's, quote, didactic performance, scolding Kissinger. And it's not like the Democrats thought super highly of Kissinger. Um, So, like, here's the problem, too. So uh, we mentioned the moral obligation to women. He also said when it came to Cambodia, quote, I may be the most immoral son of a gun in this room. Uh, bragging about it. Quote, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing about morality, our moral obligation. There's a point where you are incapable of meeting moral obligation that exists worldwide. And that's true. But that is a Mott and Bailey argument from you break something, you bought it. If I punch you in the eye, I have a responsibility to mend your eye. I don't have a responsibility to perform ocular surgery on every blind person in the planet. I have agency for this trauma that I cause. I got to fix it. So in, se- in 75 with Vietnam, 
later on in Cambodia, which I think I don't have a timestamp here, but that'd be like, I don't know, 78, 79. And then again in 2010, we see Joe Biden, um, sometimes in nearly the exact same words, talking about moral obligation with disdain. And, and that is important. That is important because just earlier this year, in a move that shocked Democrats across the spectrum, even inside his own caucus, like, you know, he's kind of the closer pace. Joe Biden quietly was trying to sign an executive order that would have maintained the Stephen Miller, Donald Trump level of refugee count at 15,000. After making a promise during the campaign to raise the refugee level up to 125,000. Sort of virtue signaling that, you know, he understood that the, at least the politics of the party said that the way Trump and Donald and Miller wanted to treat refugees was abysmal. But when he became president, his initial impulse until he was caught with his hand in the cookie jar here would be to keep the cap at 15,000 annually, saying that that remains justified by humanitarian concerns and is otherwise in the national interest. Only after he was caught doing this did he then revise it up to about 62,000 and the administration um, touted this as a big success, not framing it as, hey, we met half of our campaign promise of 125,000, but rather we're doing four times better than Donald Trump. Yeah, it's always comparative to the other guy when it needs to be. Um, I mean, this is this is important though. Yeah. People go, "Why did Joe Biden?" Do-? Or actually, here's the problem. Back then, no one actually thought to really consider in a deeper way. Why did Joe Biden have the initial impulse to keep the refugee levels at this fifteen thousand and sixty-five thousand? These are small levels. These are very small levels. We're talking about a tiny town somewhere in America, every, you know, I mean, not a tiny town, but like not a very big one either, somewhere in America every year over the next four years. He has to pick four locations, basically. I mean, that's not even how it works. You're just talking about dropping in a few hundred people here, a few hundred people there, a few hundred people there, getting people settled into communities, all that sort of thing. Um, very easy. And Joe Biden uh, in, in his administration was quietly trying to keep this as it was, um, given the option to do this quietly, and, and instead took the risk of getting noise. Like, like there was no value added in this. Um, so it really did beg the question. And, and, and to that point, another question or another example of this like question, like, why, Joe? Like, why do this? Um, is this story that came out overnight about the French transcript? Have you seen this? No. Okay, so Joe Biden has a phone call with Emmanuel Macron, who is in hot water himself uh, for catering and kowtowing to right wingers, going like, "Oh, I'm not going to take any refugees." So, like, there's a little bit of hypocrisy going on here too. I like let let I note that, but that's not actually really relevant to the story. Macron's on the phone with Joe Biden, and when he's on the phone with Joe Biden, both parties take transcripts. Remember, this happened to Trump a few times, too, where they tried to omit something and the other side would release the transcript. So, like, they knew this This is a thing that happens. There is a section in the conversation where Macron talks about how he thinks it's really important that the United States takes in refugees because it's a, it's a thing of moral responsibility. And he tells Biden, we cannot abandon them. And uh, the other thing, uh, Macron underlined the absolute need to ensure the rapid and concrete coordination among allies on the ground to continue the evacuations. The White House chose to omit this entire passage from the conversation. Why? They got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. So, kind of like the last one, they saw some sort of value added in omitting this. And I don't, I'm asking why I am not even trying to ask like a leading question because I don't necessarily know the answer to either one of those, but in the context of this history lesson, it does steer me in certain directions. And if I was going to go in other directions, it's hard to do that and just buck the history lesson here. Um, and, and again, Biden gets asked, uh, on August 20th, uh, that was just yesterday. Uh, if there's been any questioning of, of the U S by allies on the world stage, like in a public facing way. This is a thing that is being asked of him as in 
sir, you have been getting criticized on the world stage. And Joe Biden, in a move that is eminently Trumpy, and I don't have another way of putting it, says, it's actually the exact opposite. That's a quote. The exact opposite. He has seen the exact opposite. He must have missed when the Parliament of the United Kingdom, in a bipartisan fashion with Tories and Labour alike, getting in on this through Boris Johnson and Joe Biden in the fire. He could have read this article on the 18th, um, reported by Ben Riley Smith. Joe Biden's handling of Afghanistan withdrawal was condemned as catastrophic and shameful on Wednesday by the Houses of Parliament in an unprecedented rebuke to the United States president. One that uh, Joe Biden had, in fact, heard the exact opposite about, uh, that it's actually been going really well. And uh, he says he's seen no questioning of our credibility from our allies around the world stage. The article continues, MPs and peers from all over the political spectrum, including Boris Johnson, put some blame for the Taliban's takeover on America. On America. Mr. Biden was accused of throwing us and everyone else into the fire by pulling out United States troops and was called dishonorable for criticizing Afghan forces for not having the will to fight. Joe Biden uh, on Monday, I'm adding a little bit in here, on Monday in his first speech said that the reason that the Afghan people are not getting evacuated in a more timely fashion is due to the fact that they just weren't ready to go Um, and that the Afghan government... Um, that they, they're just lazy, that they just weren't, they weren't helping their people out. And it's uh, too bad, so sad, but we got to go now. Um, not, you know, maybe we didn't teach them democracy or ha- how to have a functioning government that serves the needs of the people in two decades, but you know, too bad, so sad. Sorry. Bye. Um, there's more. The Tory chairman, this would be like the Republicans over there called out Joe Biden's criticism of the Afghan army to see their commander in chief call into question the courage of the men I fought with. To claim that they ran is shameful to the murmurs of approval from other MP. Labor MP Chris Bryant said that Biden's remarks about Afghan soldiers were some of the most shameful comments from an American president. Uh, Khalid Mahmoud, a Labor MP and a former defense minister, said the Biden government have just come in and without looking at what is happening on the ground, taken a unilateral decision, throwing us and everyone else into the fire. So, like, he's getting roundly criticized, telling everyone it's fine, saying that, you know, unlike Obama, uh, this is in the speech on Monday, Obama wanted to surge, he never wanted to surge, he really understood, you know, what's best in this Afghanistan situation the whole time is the implied conceit there. And that, like, this is ultimately going pretty well, and he's not really hearing about anyone criticizing him or anything like that. You know, uh, I bet Biden and his his wonderful team are wondering right now, how come none of these supposed allies are characterizing their response as the lesser evil response from what we could have experienced through Trump? Because I'm sure the world at large would, would, it's just, it's just dying to, portray biden in that in in that way uh i this is the the presumption that that biden you know he's not saying it it should be there but his presumption is how come none of my friends are pointing out that it would have been worse if trump had done this uh right right yeah like how come the lesser two evils argument doesn't work in the world of actual (laughs) Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the, the problem is you can have the lesser two evils and still not have good. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's sort of though. What's funny is that like the lesser two evils thing. I, this has always been a criticism of like the same people who are fans of accelerationist style, like political narratives always forget that when you say the lesser two evils, you're implying you're going to get two evils. So you're just accelerating evil. Oh, and, you know, you're making it faster. Uh, but to your point, the French and the British critiques of Biden are particularly damning because what Biden's team has been selling this week uh, to introduce yet another fun word into today's conversation has been something that spent a bit. The, the word came to mind this week when I was reading all these headlines. Panglossian. Um, Pangloss is a character from Voltaire's Candide. 
uh, like the classic like French satirical novel that in particular is making fun of a philosopher, Leibniz, who answers the problem, like the kind of classic religious problem of why is there evil in the world? You have this idea, you know, there's all this evil in the world, but God is all good. Why is that? Um, historically, some philosophers have said, well, we have to choose that, like, you know, that you can't do good unless there is an act of choosing. There's been lots of different ways of solving this problem of if God is all knowing, all good and all powerful, why is this world that we live in not reflective of God? Like what, where does this evil come from? And Leibniz's clean and elegant answer um, that is fraught with uh, issues, as elegant and clean answers often are, is that this is the best of all possible worlds. That it doesn't get any better than this. And that is, that. so that's where the term Panglossian comes from. Pangloss is uh, Candide's teacher, and throughout this novel, as bad thing after bad thing happens to Candide. Imagine, like, Dumb and Dumber, right? Like, you're watching Harry and, and Marv, um, they're going through bad thing after bad thing, and imagine a third character there explaining to Harry and Marv as their tongues are stuck to the uh, ski slope thing. And, you know, they're trying to get off, like, don't worry, it has to be this way. There's no other way it could have possibly been. This is the best of all possible journeys. At the end of it, it'll absolutely be worth it. Um, and, and you know, it, it, the Dumb and Dumber actually works as a plot because, like, at the end, it's absolutely not worth it. Not really. Um, like, you know, they, they have like a stupid adventure and they get nothing at the end of it. Um, I except I ended up on that bus. Um, or actually, no, they don't end up on the bus. They keep walking. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. They don't even get on the bus at the end. Um, yeah. So, like, the way Biden and his team have been painting this, it, it's that. Well, how, how could this have possibly gone better? And as I sort of outlined earlier, if you know that B Trump has effectively saddled us with this withdrawal, then pretty much from the second you get in office, you're like, we're all in on the Afghanistan withdrawal. We're trying to do it. You're definitely not saying in July, we think it's going to be fine. Um, we're not even worried about the Taliban taking over. You're saying, you know, we are worried about the Taliban taking over, but if they do take over, they do. We're going to get our people out. Um, you know, like part of withdrawing is that we can't project power in the region like that anymore. But while we can, our last act of power projection is going to be to get our people and the Afghan people out of there who served us so nobly and get them home and established here. And it's an absolute shame on this administration uh, that that one former Pence advisor who like went on CNN and just ripped the military and Stephen Miller a new one this week. Like, I mean, it's an absolute shame on the previous administration that they did nothing to help our Afghan allies. We're not going to do that. But that's our last act. We're doing that and then we're out of there because the people want us out of there. People there want us out of there. People here want us out of there. We got to move on. Um, there's a completely different disposition to this other than not even worried about the Taliban. It's gonna be fun. I, uh, if you're uh, if you're against regime change wars, how do you feel right now? Uh, I'm wondering uh, from the far left, what what. I mean, largely, is, I think they're vindicated because, I mean, th those those same people are people who have historically not really been particularly receptive to human rights issues. Um, mm -hmm. They're against intervening in Syria despite the million plus refugee crisis. Um, just, you know, like like they, they go, well, that's the price of peace. You know, sometimes in order to have peace, you just have to displace a couple million people. And that's the way it goes. That's the price for peace. Um, I, I'm just saying, like, Biden, here's uh, uh, from a transcript uh, from back in July. Question, Mr. President, do you trust the Taliban, Mr. President? Another question. Is the Taliban takeover of, over of Afghanistan now inevitable? Biden goes, no, it is not. And someone goes, why? And Biden goes, well, because you, the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped Again, this uh, look at the Afghan, the like the Afghanistan papers that came out, or the story that we did uh, like last year or the year prior. We've been training troops and spending a, like 
like a million plus dollars per or no, I think it was more than that per soldier. And we only had like 500 trained. Um, like we're not good. And, and Biden goes, because you, the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped as well-equipped as any army in the world and an air force against something like 75,000 Taliban. It's not inevitable. I know that there are concerns about why we did not. Uh, uh, oh, this is a different quote. Um, it, but he, he actually talks about, you know, not triggering a uh, crisis of confidence. Um, and then, yeah, at the back end here, you know, he's saying he talked to President Ghani in July. And now he's blaming Ghani for not telling him the truth. But we're supposed to have intelligence. It's not supposed to be about taking Ghani at face value. You know who took dubious world leaders at face value when they would report facts to the president donald trump that's that's a donald trump move yeah but just like just like how joe biden doesn't have to really face the opposition of how his administration fa- failed here um there really isn't going to be that sort of push uh, that is going to have to be feel. Th- this isn't going to be fielded at all. No, uh, it's hard. It's it's not. This is very much like the Delta variant situation, where there is a very relevant and salient and meaningful critique of Biden's response to the Delta variant situation right now. That the Republicans, because their ideas and solutions are patently worse in largely speaking the electorate is aware of this absolutely has no use for the only people who care about what the republicans have to say are the republicans right now um like the idea oh joe biden he'd be handling the delta variant better if we just banned all masks and vaccines that doesn't hunt with anyone who's not a you know republican and and largely speaking i don't think even independents um, are particularly interested in like let's reinvade afghanistan insofar as this is going bad enough that the administration ended up having to send back 6,000 troops to stabilize things. Um, I think people probably view that as a bad thing. Like they view it as good that he did it versus not doing it, but not good as in like an unbalanced thing. Yeah, there's, uh, I think that's, that's one hallmark of, of, uh, I think us being on the 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 right track with certain stories here. I, I don't know what our the, the the lane is is here for. Uh, uh, don't worry about the government, but it, it seems as though there is sort of a radar for uh, picking up uh, picking up narratives that are valid, but don't have the momentum the establishment needs them to have. Uh, and uh, actually that point- gets us, that gets us into the B section here. Uh, well, Cause we did, we've done a very long a section here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that gets us into segue and then B section and going home. So the segue here is that as the Taliban has been invading the capital and overthrowing the elected government of Afghanistan, there has been some strange new respect starting to brew for the Taliban from a group of people who have historically not been particularly big fans of the Taliban. Mm. To be honest, the Taliban is epic, said one white nationalist commentator. While much of the world has watched in horror at the swift Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, the far white internet hordes and extremists linked to neo-Nazi terror groups are applauding the fundamentalist insurgents. I think Islam is poisonous, but these farmers (laughs) and minimally trained men fought to take their nation back from world governments. They took back their national religion as law and executed dissenters. Hard not to respect that. Many of these posts were blatantly anti-Semitic and celebrated the Taliban's resistance to the global Jewish cabal, a racist and inaccurate trope commonly cited on Telegram. If white men in the West had the same courage as the Taliban, we would not be ruled by Jews currently, said the same Proud Boy linked post viewed close to 2,500 times. 
Um, let me see if I can get you some more quotes here. To be honest, the Taliban is epic, said a commentator on uh, Telegram. The U.S. had to invade in the early 2000s and stay over 20 years spending $1 trillion. That's way low, bro. And dozens and dozens of American lives to hold them back. As soon as we left, the Taliban took over the whole country in like 12 hours. Lamau. I celebrate every time the U.S. government is embarrassed. You should, too. Yeah. You should, too. Uh, one last one. For those unaware, NATO is pulling out of Afghanistan after 20 years of war with the Taliban and losing, the blog stated. This should, in fact, be celebrated as a victory over the Jewish-controlled world. While the Taliban does have its faults, they are, nonetheless, a market enemy of the Jews. They continued, another reason to celebrate this victory for the Taliban is yet another example that our enemy, this system, is but a paper tiger. Now, you might go, okay, that's fringe white supremacists. Okay, that's uh, that, that's okay. But th- then you have Tucker Carlson this week doing a segment about how at least the Taliban doesn't have critical race theory and they're taking the, the capital. I'll make sure to splice that into the final edit here if you haven't heard that. Um, Alex Berenson making, just, just taking a joke here, um, has, is commenting on, um, freedom of speech and the Taliban person talks about big tech being bad. And this of course speaks so deeply to the conservative heart of big tech censorship that Alex Berenson, the guy who used to write for the New York times, got fired from the New York times for not being very good at his job and now makes money pimping that all the vaccines are bad and that your kids are going to get autism and this, that, and the third. Um, He goes, fact check, time to move to Kabul. Um, Then you get Don Jr. making a little glib joke about how there's not a lot of diversity or mask wearing with the Taliban there in uh, in the Capitol, um, you know, as they're standing there in the occupied offices of the Capitol. Just just a little bit of Taliban fetidization here. And you might go, okay, Chris, you're reading a bit into that. You're be- reading a bit into that. I mean, the white nationalists, I read a lot of quotes here. I got three other three examples. Watch the Tucker Carlson segment for yourself. I mean, he clearly shows it, it's the, I don't support the Taliban, but, and then you got like about six sentences after there. We need to understand. Actually, you know what? So why am I bringing this all up? Why am I bringing this all up? Because this I don't support but thing is exactly how the Republicans responded to the domestic terror attack. The second one in less than a year. The second one in nearly six months. The second one fueled by the same politics and the same informational sources. In less than a year, this was the beginning. This is the beginning. This is not the end. That was not isolated. This is a trend. Did not mean for that to be a rhyming couplet. Um... What I, I I hate it when it happens. I like like you know, when you're like trying to just make a point, and then it goes into rhyme. Um, so Mo Brooks, in response to the domestic terror attack, where a guy drives into the Capitol with homemade bombs, saying that he needs to stop Joe Biden and only Joe Biden can stop this. Blah blah blah. He's gonna blow up the Capitol. Mo Brooks, a guy who fueled on the Capitol riot six months ago, did he learn something? Is he one of these people who's got experience in government and now they've learned something and they've grown? No, because experience in government is one of the biggest lies in politics. People are these grown ass men and women who go to Washington are who they are. You are who you are at the age of 50. Like, you you know, you, you may pick up a new hobby or something along the way. But morally speaking, you're a formed entity. Like, you don't, like, have a moral reconstruction at 72. Um, You are what you are. So, Mo Brooks, he didn't learn anything. Why would he? How could he? Where else would he learn something in his life? Mo Brooks is a grown-ass man. And Mo Brooks says, with regards to the domestic terror threat, I'm aware of the capital bomb threat. I'm monitoring the situation. I am in Alabama. My Washington staff is accounted for and safe. I pray for the safety of the Capitol Police and first responders in the scene in Washington. Sadly, violence and the threat of violence targeting America's political institutions are far too common. Although this terrorist motivation is not yet publicly known, it was live streamed. He was live streaming. Like, like I mean, it was, it was out there. I mean, you could have known it if you wanted to know it. And generally speaking, 
I understand citizenry's anger directed at dictatorial socialism and its threat to liberty, freedom, and the very fabric of American society. There's not even a but here. There's not actually even a but here. <laughs> it, it goes, although this, that, that, that's actually a sentence. I'm just going to read the sentence because there should be a but. Um, th there is not a but. He actually replaces the but with just a mere period. So I'm going to read the sentence. Although this terrorist motivation is not yet publicly known. Oh my God. Although this terrorist motivation is not yet publicly known. And generally speaking, I understand citizenry anger directed at dictatorial socialism and its threat to liberty, freedom, and the very fabric of American society, period. The way to stop socialism's march is for patriotic Americans to fight back in the 22, 2022 and 2024 elections. I strongly encourage patriotic Americans to do exactly that, even more so than before. Bluntly stated, America's future is at risk. Now, you might just say, Chris, he's a buffoon. He's a buffoon. He's a dopus. This is a guy who's not very good at the sentence. And so, you know, he should have said but. He didn't say but. He put the statement out hastily. Um, it's just, isn't it the darndest thing that this statement was so weak that that but actually makes all the difference? between it actually serving as a disjunctive negating statement that it's correct to go and vote and it's wrong to go and blow yourself up that like when you write it like this it, isn't it it's just it's just crazy just to sound like Columbo here a little bit just a little coincidence um that <laughs> you, you got you got this although this terrorist motivation is kind of understandable because you got this dictatorial socialism, threat to liberty, freedom, and, and the very fabric of American society is at risk here. That he didn't even say but, as in the negative construction of and. He, he didn't say, it's a, he, you know, he didn't even try, imply and or. Because but usually is put out there as it's, it's this or it's this, like kind of an and or thing. He just, he just forgot it, Brian. Isn't that the darndest thing? You know, uh, in order to disarm the GOP as best we can from utilizing the Taliban uh, to their advantage, to their narrative advantage, we need to find out if the Taliban is pro-life or pro-choice. I really need to know that because there is only one issue that can derail the hearts and minds of Republicans that can turn friends into enemies. No matter how connected you are to another group of this time Muslim and uh, 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 guerrilla fighters, uh, no matter how connected you can find yourself saying like we have, you know what, let's put our differences aside. If the Taliban is pro-choice, this is all over. We just need to find out what they think about abortion. And this can all, th this won't be over, but this will be over. I feel like I have a new calling slash I, I'm just going to do a Google search later. What does the Taliban think about abortion? And just well, speaking of this is going to be over, I, I now I have to end the show on this note because there's no we can go no place else after I make this joke. So we just have to end the show. Oh, no. I think the answer here clearly is that the Taliban needs to let the GOP know that they are pro-life. They got to put out a video, obviously, like you need you need videos. You know what I mean? Like in this day and age, so like the a, Taliban needs to put out a video. Go on. Yeah. So <laughs> in this video, they cut off the head of an infidel, say that that guy was an abortionist and they're extremely pro-life. And then they just stare into the camera and go, G.O.P. 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 We love you. <laughs> I, uh, you know, Saturday Night Live isn't as provocative as they once were, but in, Th that's an understatement. For, in, 
my Saturday in 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 my uh, uh, in my dream world, my Saturday Night Live, that's the that's the introductory. Uh, that's that's the first skit we get to see. But uh, dreams don't come true for me that often. We will uh, not be giving the vaccine to the people. <laughs> Men will not have to wear masks. Eh, women, eh, we got rules. Uh, yes, 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 yes. This is where, you know, um, you know, Margaret Atwood was wrong about so many things as far as the GOP is concerned. And, and so, so was, uh, so is the Taliban. They're, they're wrong about a lot of things, but maybe the women should be wearing different clothes, you know, uh, uh may, maybe, maybe, maybe Atwood got that right. And so did the Taliban. Uh, uh, it, that's not what you or I think, of course. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, I'm not really a, I'm bad at fashion stuff as uh, ex-girlfriends have made it a point to point out to me. So yeah, like, uh, that, Look, that's, if, that's not thing if I make, if I make a, a, a new fashion statement, it would more be along the line of, uh, um, the aliens have it right with the one piece suit it's not really that a religion got it right it's that uh you know the the aliens got it right and we're, we're all gonna we're all gonna wear something uh i just hope it's uh hammer pants you know uh hammer pants uh alien maybe. clothes alien clothes is form fitting you you and i both know that hammer pants in the future will be absolutely irrelevant like like okay well, whenever you see aliens they... with poofy clothing it's clearly not an accurate portrayal of the, of the future because it like they'll wear they're being wearing sleek and sexy form-fitting clothing on their alien bodies okay well you're so preoccupied with the successful future that i'm more interested in how the aliens like did they get I'm that outfit? I'm concerned with the fashionable future. Right. It, but they didn't get that outfit right the first time. You know, there were some, there was a 1.0 of the alien outfit and it's not what you're thinking it turned out to be. Like what we think of as the alien outfit was like the 4.0. Let's do the 1.0 first. Let's not skip the steps. Let's get it Are wrong you, first. Are you talking before they actually built the craft? Like like what what the what the grays were wearing when they were still like just like you know on planet gray, yeah maybe they didn't know how to get off the planet but they also knew they needed an outfit. Well, but, you got you got to dress for the job you want. Right, these are not the most su successful aliens yet. They're 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 getting it wrong before they're getting it right. Can you imagine the aliens? Who eventually got it right first got it wrong i mean they don't get it right all the time like it's yeah, okay no, you can't to... you can't get it right every time but once you meet the aliens they already have got it right no yeah so, so the this, aliens... no but this yeah. we, you have this all the time in life you, you run into that guy who's really got their shit together and you're like oh shit this like person just must be better at being a human than me and they're not they're just like they got their shit together and they're just, you know, like they're ahead of you on that. They're not actually like, it's not like they have that much better of a moral life than you. You just haven't like figured out, you know, how to pay a mortgage yet or like get a credit card or something. Right. So like if only the Taliban can start wearing the Hawaiian shirts from the GOP perspective, that's a step forward. Uh, right. And, and, and they're certainly going to be continuing to put out memes. I mean, I guess to end on a slightly serious note of sorts, um, I mean, it's not... Oh, no. It's not unrealistic to me to see more GOP Taliban curiosity, like, oh, gotta love these Taliban memes, especially with the alt-right. Uh, I could see them... I could see the Taliban realizing there's some real utility in putting out Taliban memes. Um, and <sighs> it's very clear that the politics of the right right now is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, and the Dems are the bigger enemy. So that's where we're at. That's going to do it for this show. Good episode. Good episode. Um, Brian, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, at Postman RTs, at Postman Retweets. I, I'm uh, 
I don't know if it's a, a, a dark phase, but uh, I'm definitely doing a lot of editing outside of social media that's kind of like scratching that social media itch. I don't know. They're, they're, I've basically been rambling on a few different Twitter, hand, Twitter handles for the last couple of years, and I'm trying to put all the relevant shit in, together in a certain stream. And uh, uh, You can find me on... at postman retweets uh and hopefully you can find me putting out something uh more uh galvanizing uh th than i have before we'll see uh this show can be found at dwatg uh homepage don't worry dot tv patreon.com slash dwatg get the full video version of the show get the slates um all that good jazz to support the show that's that's how this show makes its money we're not doing advertisements or any of that stuff and a buck a show one dollar per show is the minimum i can charge and the minimum honestly the max like i'm asking so please if you can if you've got it a buck a show i know times are still a little bit tight right now for people um it's also why i keep it a dollar a show i figure You've got five bucks on a monthly basis. Like we're putting out three to four a month right now. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just not asking big stuff of anyone. So patreon.com slash DWATG. If you could, if you would much oblige. Um, as for me, you can find me at DWATG. You can leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify. And that is pretty much all the places to get in touch with the show. Go and check out shake them ropes. If you want to hear me talk about CM Punk, otherwise, I will see all of you people, or talk to all of you people here on the next show. Bye-bye.